<laughs> Thanks, Tommy. Hey, my name is Nate. I serve as a husband, dad, pastor alongside our lead pastor and under him. And uh, he is in uh, Florida um, on vacation. And he uh, needs to rest and rejuvenate. So we're thankful that he is away. And uh, I think he said he had five books. Five, I mean that. He needs to rest. And uh, I think he's, he said he had five books to read. And uh, we'll see if he can really disengage. He loves this church very much. And I'm grateful to serve alongside and under him. Hey, we are going to talk about Jesus, romance, and you. Now you probably thought, this is probably a sermon that I'd love to just sleep in. I don't want to be here for that. I don't want to hear Nate talk about romance. Might be a little awkward. And uh, he's going to talk about, you know, men, you need to, you know, have a date night and be romantic and chocolate and roses. And, and uh, <laughs> I'm actually not going to talk about that at all, Tammy. So, Ken, you and I obviously need to talk. Your marriage needs to help, my friend. So I'll be, I'll be at the family room, okay? Fill out that connection card. We'll follow up with you this week. Um, Galatians, we're going to be in Galatians 2.20, and I'm not talking about chocolate and roses and date nights. Sorry. Um, I'm talking about something a little different. Now, when you think about romance, all of us have a different perspective and definition of romance. Romance, if you were to look it up, is this um, other-oriented posture. And I was talking with a couple of weeks ago was a, at a dinner, and as we were talking, describing our understanding of romance, he described romance as a sneak attack. You never know where he's going to come from and what romance looks like in his household. I didn't pursue that because I was a little unsure of what that meant, and so we, we left that alone. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I want to talk about Jesus, and, and um, I was talking with my bride, and, and she said, you know, this, it's not the most... Sound, doesn't sound like the most encouraging sermon, and I, I pray that I pray that it will be encouraging. And and here's here's the main the main point, the big idea, if you will. It's this: union with Jesus is indispensable to romance. Now, if you're married, you're like, okay, leaning in. This is a, this is a sermon for me, but it's really a sermon for everybody because I'm not just talking to married people. Romance is that other oriented posture, intimacy, to think of others, to serve others, to love others. So it's not just married couples, but in the room we have people who are widows and widowers who have lost their husband or their wife in years or decades past or recently. We've got people who are single because of a divorce. We've got people who are single who have yet to engage in their upcoming marriage. We've got engaged couples. And so this is a truth that I believe that if you get it down and you embrace it, it will change your marital relationship, and it will change your friendship. So I mentioned this in the first service. I spoke directly to John Pierce and Kai Jenkins and Kyle Sanders and Faith Lowe and Zach Sanders and Kate Wathen, who, all of whom are engaged. And I said this to them, if they'll get this down, it will be life-changing for their marriage. And if you can get this down, it'll be life-changing for your marriage and your friendships. And I said this in the first service, and I believe it, God is always doing a million and one things, and at times God gives us a glimpse into what he's doing. But I've been praying for weeks that God would change somebody's marriage today. I've been praying that God would change uh, somebody's friendship today, that the trajectory of their life would change, because as they realize the truth from Galatians 2.20, that they have been living for themselves, and when you live for self, undoubtedly, conflict is going to happen. Turmoil and hardships. As the Toby Keith song says, we uh, live for my, me, myself, and I, and that is antithetical to the truth of what Paul says and what Jesus says and what the, the Declaration of Christianity teaches. And so we're going to walk through Galatians 2.20, and if you are physically able to, if you'll stand with me, let's read just this one verse. And... Uh, It'll be on the screens, one verse, as we talk about Jesus, romance, and you. All right, let's read this together. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is God's voice written down for you and for me. May God bless the preaching of it 
and the hearing of it. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we would sit under the Bible. We at times, I at times sit over top of it, sit to the left or the right, but a believer is to come under the word of God. Jesus, in John chapter 6, you asked the disciples, do you too want to leave as you, Jesus, gave a hard word about what it means to believe and follow you? And Peter said, where else would we go? Who has the words of life? Jesus, you are the word of God. Come down, having lived a perfect life. You are the word of life. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would change someone's life today. Is that too much to ask? It's not. All things are possible with you. So I pray that you would change a life or lives today for the good and the renown of our crucified and resurrected King, we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Union with Jesus is indispensable to romance or to your friendships and your marriage relationship. What you believe about God will determine the quality of your friendships and marriage. What you believe about God will determine the quality of your friendships and your marriage, as you'll see on the screen. So you might be a believer this morning. I would imagine that a lot of people in the room are believers, and there is undoubtedly people in the room that are not believers, that are trusting in themselves, trusting in moralism, behavior, their good deeds, their performance. There are people who are skeptical and are seekers and searching out Christianity, and I want you to know that you're welcome here. We're so grateful that you have come, maybe by the invitation of a friend or a family member, or you've just stumbled upon Grayson, and we're really humbled and thankful that you are here. But what you believe about God, whether you're a believer or unbeliever, determines the quality of your friendships and your marriage. And our theology, what we believe about God, governs the way that we view life. We are all theologians. And in this verse, we see a truth that union with Jesus is indispensable to live in the life that God's called us to live. And the application this morning is romance, this other-oriented posture. Or if you wanted to distill it down or make it even more broad, you could say that union with Jesus is indispensable in our efforts and pursuit and the call that God has placed upon our life to love and to serve others. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Jesus lives in me. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. And when you understand that truth, it simultaneously humbles you and empowers you. When you understand the truth of the good news of Jesus, that you are more sinful than you ever understood and realized, and yet you are also more treasured and loved than you'll ever be able to fully understand, it simultaneously brings humility and empowerment, courage, confidence in your life. Christians should be the most confident, courageous people on the face of the universe because we're the recipient of the covenant affection of God. We should also be the most humble people on the face of the planet because we understood and understand what we deserve. It brings humility and courage. The writer of Isaiah 66 verse 2, the prophet Isaiah says that humility draws the gaze of God. That when God is directing his focus over here and you put on humility and you're humble in your relationships and in your friendships and your marriage, God goes from being drawn over here to being drawn over there because humility draws the gaze of God. What brings the opposition of God? Pride. Arrogance. Where we think about ourselves. Pride causes God to be Opposed, And I fully believe with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, with every ounce of my being, that the reason there are, is so much friction, tension, conflict, and friendships, and marriages, and churches, is because we think about ourselves way too much. We think about our preferences, our ambitions, our pursuits, our comforts, our conveniences, and in a relationship that is, the, that is the most intimate, this side of heaven, marriage, we think about what we want, and when we don't get it, friction and tension and sin enters in. And in close friendships, 
as well. Pride is self-focused. And Jesus wants us to understand as he inspired the Apostle Paul to write down these, this letter to the churches in Galatia that we have to get the gospel right. We have to live out this good news of Christ and where, what marks what are the marks of a person who has been radically changed by the good news of Jesus, this union with Jesus? To believe and trust in Jesus is to be changed at the most deep level. You have died, and now you are a new person in Jesus, and you are called not to live for yourself, not to live for your own comforts and preferences and conveniences and ambitions and wants and needs but to live and to serve the people around you. It is an unbelievably difficult call that God places upon our life. But as Paul says, we do not do it on our own, do we? We do it through Jesus who lives in us and has brought about a new creation. If you're a believer in Christ, you're a a new person. Now, I know when you look in the mirror, there are times you do not feel like a new creation, right? Right? I don't feel new and I don't stink and look new. But the Bible says we need to tell our emotions and feelings the truth. My professor said it's absolutely okay if you talk back to yourself, as long as you talk back to yourself in truth. You need to preach to your heart truth. And union with Jesus is indispensable if you're going to have quality friendships and marriage. And by the way, this is not just a sermon so that you'll have quality friendships and a marriage. The marching orders that we have as Graceland Baptist Church, and if you're a guest, this is what we're about, this is what we increasingly want to pursue, is that we want to see neighborhoods, the generations and the nations transformed through Jesus Christ. And it's got to start with the household of God. We don't go out in the highways and the byways and talk to generations young and old. We don't go to the nations. We don't go to the neighborhoods and talk about how Jesus changes us when we continually want to live for ourselves. We've got to die to ourselves and let Jesus live through us. Paul writes, I've been crucified together with Christ. Paul's dying on the cross has ongoing effects in his life. But first, what does it mean to be crucified with Jesus? Paul used to live for moralism. He used to live for behavior modification. He used to live for performance. He used to live for works of the law. That's how he evaluated you, and that's how he evaluated himself. Am I living a good work? The status, the condition, the spiritual barometer on his life was hot if he lived and did the things that God wanted him to live and do. But he says there's a shift. There's a shift, there's a shift in focus from his former way of life to the way that he views his life now. He used to live by way of works and performance and behavior. You know what, that is my life at times. I evaluate my life, whether or not God is pleased with me at times based upon what I do, rather than what has been done in Jesus. And my heart so often is drawn away from the grace that is mine in Jesus. It's drawn away from the finished work of Christ. It's drawn away from what God tells us in the Word, specifically about His Son. That there's no more that people have to do. Sinful man, woman, all they have to do is to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, will you please forgive me of my sins? I trust in you. My heart is drawn away from that truth because I increasingly want to see my heart yielded to Jesus, but there are, there are messages that vie for the affections of my heart. Here's several. Legalism. We base our relationship with God on our own performance. Legalism teaches that you have to do this and that in order to be accepted by God. That is not true, right? Right? All a believer has to do, all a person has to do is to come to faith in Christ. It is the easiest decision you will ever make and it is the hardest decision you will ever make because Jesus wants every ounce of your life surrendered to him. He's the king of the universe. Why would the king expect anything less? But people get involved in legalism when they evaluate things based upon things that they do or shouldn't do, box-checking Christianity. 
condemnation where you are more focused on your sin than on God's grace. One person said many years ago that for every one look that you look upon your sin, take ten looks upon Jesus. Do not be fixated upon your sin. Be fixated and focused upon Jesus who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Or subjectivism. I don't really know how to spell that, so if you are looking at the app, I gave that one to you. You didn't have to fill in the blank, but fill in the blank there. But what is subjectivism? It's basing your relationship with God upon your changing feelings and emotions. Have you ever woken up and thought, I don't feel forgiven? I've committed this particular sin with a regularity that is embarrassing. I did this, said that, thought that. Thank God I didn't go there, but I went there one time. And at times we base our relationship with the Father based upon our feelings and emotions. How does this relate to marriage and friendship and romance and intimacy? Here's how it relates. I think about your performance I think about your behavior. I think about your sin. I think about my changing feelings and emotions, and I don't feel like loving you. Do you always feel like loving people? Come on. Do you always feel like serving people? No. And for all of you who said yes, you are delusional. (laughs) I don't want to be a friend, I don't want to serve. I don't want to think of you. I don't want to pursue your preferences because I want to live for myself. But I have to remind myself that I died with Jesus. And Jesus now lives in me. Union with Jesus is indispensable to the quality of your friendships and marriage. Too many individuals are self-oriented. If Jesus has changed you at the deepest level, it causes you, propels you, compels you to be other-oriented. But too many individuals in their friendships and in their marriages are concerned about waiving their rights, their preferences, my respect, what I deserve, I want appreciation, I want acknowledgement, I want my needs, I want affirmation. And those things in and of themselves are not bad. But we, hear me out, we have such a bent towards self. We have such an inclination to think that the world is about us. So we can take wants and needs that are good things and we can prop them up and then we start making demands. I want appreciation and demand respect. I want affirmation and demand courtesy. I want cuddle time. and I want and demand words of affirmation. And we prop them up. And when we don't get what we want, where we need to be reminded, Nate died. Nate died. Paul is not speaking about legalism or condemnation or subjectivism, but he's speaking about, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, about the doctrine of justification. Paul's courage and confidence has shifted from being about and enamored about performance and works and behavior to believing and embracing what God has said about his life in Jesus. Justification refers to your status before God. So everybody who came into the room today has one of two statuses. You are either justified or you are not. You are either declared righteous and not guilty and forgiven and cleansed, not because of anything that you do, but because of Jesus, or you are not declared not guilty. You're guilty and stand unforgiven. When you place your faith in Jesus, God hands down the verdict that you are clean, forgiven. He transfers the sinless, perfect righteous account of Jesus and he transfers it to your account and takes your sinful record your life your words your affections your pursuits your behavior your inconsistency your wickedness and he transfers it to Jesus there's this great cosmic exchange as I said before and when the father looks upon you if you've believed upon Jesus he declares you not guilty righteous forgiven cleansed not in and of yourself but Christ So for a believer, justification is the same for everybody. So here's a question, a little comic relief, since this is a heavy sermon. 
who is more justified? Pastor Larry or me? Who's more justified? Pastor Larry or me? Is this a trick question? The answer is neither. We're both justified in the same way. Now, because justification is an act of God. God justifies. He's both just and justifier. He's the one to declare somebody not guilty. Now, follow-up question, who's more sanctified? Who looks more like Jesus, Pastor Lair or me? I don't want to hear your answer. We're moving on. But Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Jesus lives in me. The crucifixion is not just an account on the, of the most amazing event in history, but it's also a detail of every Christian's story as well. Jesus died in your place. The tense of the words that Paul uses denotes something that actually happened. Paul and any believer were actually considered by God to be crucified with Jesus, not in a subjective sense, but in actual reality. That reality that Christ died for Paul is my reality and your reality if you're in Jesus. And so the reason why this is so important and the reason why I chose one verse, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, is because it teaches that I am to no longer pursue and champion my rights. I am no longer to pursue and champion my wants and my preferences. The life that Jesus has given to me is a life that he lives through me and I'm called to live selflessly and think of others. Union with Jesus is indispensable to having, to having quality friendships and a marriage. This is so antithetical to our culture. It is not what our age teaches us. We talk about self-preservation, self-esteem, self-improvement, self-indulgent, self, 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 self. Our biggest problem is self. One biblical writer said that the biggest problem in my life is me. There's a lady, this is the truth, you can verify this with my bride. There's a lady that came up to my bride several months ago when I was preaching at Graceland Palmyra, and she said this, and I just think it's hilarious. She said, he must be such a blessing to live with. <laughs> God honest truth, and my wife said, Without, without any hesitation, sometimes. Sometimes. And I'm increasingly hoping it's more and more. Do you, know, you want to know why I've been married 17 years, almost 17 years, and it's not a long time. I'm a young man, and I have a lot to learn. A lot to learn. And I think the older you get, and hopefully the more mature and godly you are, you realize you have a lot to learn. So I hope that's the case with my life in the years, decades to come. But our marriage was really difficult the first 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. <laughs> and it's because, it's because that I didn't live out Galatians 2.20. I didn't know that at the time. And there's lots of other verses to substantiate my problems and issues. But I lived for myself. I lived for myself. And anytime you live for self, God tells us problems, friction, Conflict's going to happen, not just in your marriage, but in your friendships as well. So here's what I'm going to ask in just a moment. I'm not done, by the way, preaching. I've got a, long, a lot more to go. Okay, Pastor Larry's here. I got, an, I got another hour. Okay, here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask some of you. Some of you, you just know, man, I should have missed today. <laughs> some of you, your marriages are a wreck, and you know it. Your wife knows it. Your husband knows it. Some of you, your friendships continually have collateral damage wherever you go. And you know it. And people in this room know it. And I think the fundamental reason why is because we are pursuing self. Pride. God is opposed to pride. In James, the book of James, the tense is he is continually opposed. You know what stops the opposition of the sovereign God of the universe? Humility. 
where we say, it's not about me. My problems are not him. My problems are not her. My problems are not my friends. The problem, more often than not, is lurking in my sinful heart. I need to be reminded that I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Jesus lives in me. So the old Nate does not have power anymore. The old Nate does not have any authority anymore. The old Nate died on the cross. And I received this truth into my life as a 10-year-old when I became a believer. I didn't fully grasp, as 10-year-olds really can't, the fullness of what God calls my life to be and to do. And more and more and more and more, by God's grace, I want to die to myself. Die to my own preferences and ways and needs and conveniences and wants. And want my friendships and my marriage to exude a selflessness where I love and prefer and defer to others. This was made so unbelievably apparent, the truth of Galatians 2.20. And how the power of sin, right? The power and, 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 and chains of sin have been broken. We just got done seeing it. This became so in, unbelievably apparent Years ago, I was thinking about that. I heard this illustration. You remember the desert storm, right? The war in Iraq, Saddam Hussein. And you remember the images of our troops, who are amazing, going out for our freedom, for the freedom of people in Kuwait and Iraqis in the Middle East, and they found Saddam Hussein in a hole. Remember that? They found him in a hole. This coward of a man. They captured him and they gave him over to the Iraqi government that was still really trying to figure out who they were. And they put him on trial and they found him guilty of genocide and murder and, and all sorts of things. And they, and they appropriately put him to death. He had no more authority. No more power. No more directives could be given down from Saddam Hussein because he did not exist anymore. And yet, in the days, weeks, months, and years to follow, his presence was still felt because people who were loyal to him still carried out orders. And yet he was dead. He had no authority, no power. Transfer that truth to the Christian life. Your sin and the power of sin died on the cross. It has no longer any authority in your life. It cannot tell you what to do. But what happens, brother or sister, is sin raises its ugly head and tries to tempt you and remember who you once were. But you died on the cross. You're a new creature in Christ. It's no longer Nate and Zach and Tammy and Samantha and Adam and Reuben and Rebecca that live, but Christ lives in us. So I don't live for myself anymore. I live for the people around me. Union with Jesus is indispensable if you are going to have quality friendships in a marriage. And the reason why so often many of us don't is because we want to continue to live for self. We have to remind ourselves the truth of Galatians 2.20 and see our sin of self as bitter. Thomas Watson said, Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. He means that until we truly understand the problem, we're not going to savor the solution. Until we harbor and love and continue to make excuses and rationalize and justify and blame shift, until we stop doing that, we will not savor the Savior. And more and more, and I am not perfect, you can ask my bride, the more I see the awfulness of my sin, the more I want to, by God's grace, run to Jesus to help me be the man, husband, dad, pastor, neighbor that he wants me to be. Sin creeps into our lives and raises its ugly head and it manifests itself in so many ways. And the more you lean in and embrace union with Jesus, you'll see your sin as bitter. It will not taste good. You'll see your pride as repulsive. You'll see your snarkiness as damaging. You'll see your lust as hurtful. You'll see your spiritual aloofness as irresponsible. You'll see your anger as hideous and wicked. 
You'll see your lack of tenderness as a misrepresentation of the call that God has placed upon your life. You'll see your insensitivity as wrong. You'll see your desire for comforts and convenience as a glimpse into the old Nate. But that guy died. He doesn't exist anymore. And the Christian life can be summed up in so many ways. But one way is that we increasingly see the truth of who Jesus is coming into practice in our life and that our life would more and more be in alignment with what Jesus wants in our life. So I'm going to ask some of you in just a moment, we're going to stand to sing, and I'm going to ask some of you to not hesitate, to not pray about, but to make a beeline to talk to one of our prayer counselors, to talk to one of me, to talk to one of our leaders, say, hey, I, I need to confess. I've been living for myself, and problems and issues have arisen, and I need prayer, I need encouragement. Or I'm going to pray proactively, so, much of the, so many of the prayers in the Bible are proactive, not reactive. Maybe your marriage and your friendships are going well and you want to pray that God's protection. God, would you give me grace and mercy to embrace Galatians chapter 2, verse 20? I'm going to ask you to respond. And I don't think that you have to come forward to indicate you've made a response. But there's something about putting on humility and not caring about what people think. And just saying, I'm going to live for an audience of one. Right now, what's the Spirit of God doing in your heart? I don't want to champion my rights. I don't want to be about my preferences, my ambitions, my needs, my wants. I want to lay down my rights so I can serve others. In the church, we see so much championing of rights and preferences and ministries and song selection in preaching style, and preaching length, and mission strategy, and this or that, how about we realize we're owed nothing and we start dying to ourselves more and more and start living for what Jesus wants, who is primary. Our allegiance is to be to him. You are given rights not to waive them. You are given rights to lay them down. Why? Because that's what Jesus did in Philippians 2. This early hymn that Paul writes to the saints in Philippi. Jesus, who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And what did God do? Exalted him. The way to be exalted is to go low. Failure to do so is a failing to grasp and apply the central message of Christianity. The king who created the world, who holds the world in his sovereign hands, who all of life points to, chose to surrender his rights, his kingly rights, to go to our cross so that we might know God through faith and be changed so that we could too not tout our rights, but lay them down to love and serve one another in our friendships and in our marriage. The more you understand that truth, the more you want to change the more you're grateful for what Jesus has done and what he continually does through your life. The moment we believe, God gives us Jesus' performance and record. He gives it to us. The moment you believe, Christianity declares that there is a verdict. The moment you trust in Jesus, you're forgiven and accepted and the Father's pleased with you. Too many Christians live as if God is displeased with them talking with a friend several weeks ago and going through a difficult time and wanted to encourage him with this illustration. I wanted to encourage my own heart. As I've said here before, if Jesus were to walk in the room with all your dysfunction and all your sin and all your conflict going on, what would he say to you? How would he look? Would he be angry and upset and disappointed? Or would he say, I love you? He said, I believe that Jesus would say he loves me. So even in the dysfunction of your marriage and your friendships and how we all have room to grow, Jesus is not displeased with you. Man, he loves you more than you'll ever understand. And Christianity is a declaration. This is a pretty amazing truth. Christianity is a declaration that gives the verdict before the performance. Right? It gives the verdict... Before the performance, you're forgiven, cleansed, rescued. You are considered a son, a daughter of God. You're heaven bound before you do anything. Why? Because the Christian faith teaches a verdict based upon the perfect 
life of Jesus. And, the light, and in light of that verdict, I want to live in light of it. I want to live in response to it. The verdict has declared Nate righteous, forgiven, cleansed in Jesus. And now that verdict empowers me to lay down my rights, to lay down all my uh, preferences and needs and conveniences and wants and ambitions and pursuits to serve and to live and love others. And we operate as friends, as church men and church women, as husbands and wives, as moms and dads. We operate from that verdict. But so often, what happens is we take the contractual culture that we live in and say, I'm only going to love you and serve you and think about you and care for you and meet your needs when you meet my needs. I'll scratch you back, your back if you... You scratch mine. That's not the Christian message. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he goes to the crucifixion, said, if there's any other way that sinful men, women, boys, and girls can be reconciled, forgiven, let it be known. But not my will, your will. It's a picture of the call of a Christian. That we don't say, I like to love them, serve them, if they will respond accordingly. Jesus knew that none of us would respond accordingly. And yet he laid down his life. Christianity is a laying down of our life. Your theology governs the way that you view life. It governs the quality of your friendships and your relationships. And on your wedding day, this is true. Right? I mean, I had no stinking clue what love was on April 5th, 2003. Nor did you. Because you know what hadn't happened yet? Alzheimer's and cancer and miscarriages and a loss of a child and a loss of a spouse or a loss of a loved one or a loss of a job or all the joys and hardships that you get as married couples. Your marital vows are a declaration. I'm going to love you in spite of your performance. I'm going to love you in spite of how you treat me. I'm going to love you in good times and bad times. Union with Jesus is indispensable if you're going to have quality friendships and relationships, the verdict is this. I have been crucified with Christ. Nate no longer lives. Jesus lives in me. He gave his life. He loved me and gave himself for me. The tense of the words loved and gave are a tense that denote an actual event that he loved me and gave himself for me 2,000 years ago, but it has enduring, ongoing effects. So he loved him, gave himself for me. I believed at the age of 10, I trusted in Christ, but it should have and it will have enduring, ongoing effects upon my life so that my bride sees it, my kids see it, my neighbors see it, the members of Graceland see it, lost people see it, neighbors see it see it. Everybody sees it because Nate no longer lives. They may not understand, but I'm not about my preferences, ambitions, wants, and needs, comforts. I lay down my, life, lay down my right so that I can serve and love you. That is unbelievably difficult. Unbelievably difficult. And I need Jesus' help every minute of every hour of every day of every week because I make a mess of it at times. But you know what? I'm acknowledging more and more I am a hot mess and I need him to help. So let's stop pretending and acting as if we have everything together. Let's acknowledge the hot messed upness that we are and ask Jesus to help us so that when we go to the neighborhoods, we go to Graceland Corden, and we go to Graceland Palmyra or Graceland Jeffersonville or Graceland Scottsburg or we go to the generations young and old, median aged, or the wise, mature, godly. Or we go to Ukraine or we go to India, we go to Nepal, we go to Mexico. We want to say Jesus has changed me. We want to live at that change first in the household of God, right? So I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to respond. And the invitation is this, specific to you, wherever you are, are you living for self? Because if you're living for self, that's counter to what Jesus writes down in the Word through the penmanship of Paul. 
If you're a believer, you've died with Christ, and you're not called to live for yourself, but you're called to live for Jesus and for those around you. If you're not a believer, this is your story. You are defined by your sin, by where you are, and Jesus wants to change that. Perhaps could a life, could some friendship, could some marriage today be changed? I pray that it's the case.